You have? It's asking for audio channel, which is not there, I think. Audio. Okay, I'll do it next week. This is not working. Yours is all right, no? Yes. Okay, we will start. <coughs> now, Shanti Mantra, I mean, prayer is all part of it. <coughs> Okay, we will start. Om Yasmat Jatam Jagat Sarvam Yasmin Yeva Praliyate Yene Dam Dharyate Chaiva Tasmai Jnanat Mane Namaha Ishwaro Gururat Meti Murti Beda Vibhagine Vyomavat Vyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murta Yenamaha Taitiri Yakasarasya Maya Charya Prasadataha Vispashtarta Ruchi Namhi Vyakeyam Sampraniyate Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Ubhunaktu Sahavir Yankarava Vahai Tejasvina Vadhi Tamas Toma Virdvisha Vahai Om Shanti 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 Om Brahmavida Apnoti Param Tadesha Bhukta Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma Yo Veda Nihitam Guhayam Parame Vyoman so Oshnute Sarvan Kama Ansaha Brahmana Vipaschite Ti Tasmadva Yetasmad Atmana Akasha Sambhutaha Akashad Vayuhu Vayor Agnihi Agnerapaha अद्भ्यः प्रतिवी प्रतिव्या ओषधयः ओषधिभ्योनम् अन्नात् पुरुषः सवायेश पुरुषोन्नरसमयः तस्येदमे वशिरः आयम् दक्षिणः पक्षः आयम् उत्तरः पक्षः Ayam Atma Idam Pucham Pratishta Tadapyesha Shloko Bhavati So this is the first Anuvaka. We saw in the last class an introduction to Brahmananda Valli as to what is the central issue in Brahmananda Valli. Then we started with the first mantra, which is Brahmavida Apnoti Param. The entire Upanishadic teaching is just in this. It's over. Brahmavita Apnoti Param. Full stop. There are no commas after that. Not required also. The knower of Brahman achieves everything. So the entire Taitira Upanishad teaching is only in this sentence. This chapter 2 of Taitira Upanishad is philosophical, but the teaching is in the first sentence. The rest of the chapter is only trying to 
expand it a little bit. So this is what I was trying to argue. Now this, there are Brahma, Vith and Apnoti Param. First of all, if you look at the etymology of the word Brahman, it comes from the Dhatu Brah, Vardhane. The Brahat, all that I think comes from that. Brah means big or growing, large, vast and so on. Shankaracharya's commentary is very interesting. He says the word big. Big is an adjective. An adjective qualifies a noun. That's the meaning of adjective. Right? How he brings a very interesting point. Let us take two words, uh, two phrases. Big ant, big mountain. Let us take two. Big ant means you look down. Amongst the ants, it is slightly bigger. Moment you say big mountain, you are not going to look down. You are going to look somewhere there. So, Shankaracharya's first argument is, it is not that an adjective qualifies a noun, noun also qualifies the adjective. <laughs> because big depends on what is a noun. A big for ant has a different meaning of understanding or it creates a different kind of a, a, you know, thinking. Big mountain means your eye goes wide. <laughs> Because that notion of big is better. So he brings an interesting perspective. He says, it is not adjective depends on the noun. Noun also, I mean, it's not that noun depends on the adjective. The adjective also is depending on the noun. There is a paraspara bhava. Now, why is he saying this? Then comes this, his googly. He says, after Brahman, there is no noun. In this sentence, Brahman means big. After big, there is no noun. He has not put anything after that. So he says, clearly understand that implicitly, first of all, informs us, this is infinitely big. See how he is starting the whole argument. He says, since there is no noun attached to this word big, implicitly what it means is, this actually is infinite. Because just now we found that, uh, you know, an adjective also depends on the noun. Now, by not putting a noun after that, this big actually opens up. It's an open interval now. So, that is the etymology of the word big. So, that's Brahman. So, Brahman is something infinitely big. That is the first uh, issue. Right? For, for this one sentence and the next one sentence, he has about 40 pages of commentary. Argument, uh, Puro Paksha, then this objection, and very detailed. I mean, I could not, didn't, I didn't have time to read it uh, literally. I didn't understand some of it also. Anyway, I don't think I can ever talk about that. So, anyway, then comes with the knower, the one who knows Brahman. The question is, what is this knower that we are talking about? We have to be very clear about this also. See, Vedantic uh, philosophical discussions are very tight. You can't afford to make, uh, you know, a very loose kind of a thing. So, if you take the other fields, see, if I say I know management, I know polymer physics, there, the notion of knower, me, there is a jnata, which is a knower, there is a jnaya, which is to be known, right? And there is a process of knowing called jnanam. See, this is called the Triputi. I have talked about this Triputi many times in my Bhagavad Gita talk. It's a wonderful triangle. We have to understand the, in the world there is always triangle. So, knower, moment you bring a knower, you need two more. What used to be known and what is the process of knowing? Right? Bhokta, Bojyam, Bojanam. This is another Triputi. If there is a eater, there is a Padartha to eat and there is a process of eating. It's a very generic framework. And do you know what is the grandest Triputi? Jiva, Jagat and Ishwara. That is the biggest Triputi. Anyway, so in a, in a normal sense of the term, moment you say knowledge, which is a Jnaya, to be known, and there is a knower, 
and there is a process of knowing. In Brahma Vidya, it is not like that. Okay? So there is nothing like in other fields we may talk about knower being different from known. Because we are setting out. It is external. External objects and things which we are trying to capture. So we need to use, and why are we saying knower and known are different? Why do you say I know management? Because first of all you recognize management is something to be known, which is different from me. It's a Jnaya Padartha, this is the Jnata, so there is a Jnana. Now how do you do this? Then you need certain things. You need brain, you need memory, Chitta, Buddhi, Ahankar, Indriyas. All these are required. You have to use all these gadgets and acquire something which is not with you. That is the meaning there. The meaning there is, when I say I know management now, you can even add, add the word now. Which means yesterday I did not know management. Today I know management. If I say I know something now, which means that known is different from knower. The process of knowing invariably involves chitta, buddhi, ahankara and indriyas. You have to listen, you have to read, you have to memorize, you have to try it out and it should map onto your brain. It should get into your buddhi. Then that jnana, that uh, uh, to be known, becomes siddha. It is siddha in your, this brain and chitta are all erasable memory. Once we go, that will all go. There is only a part of it which gets into vasanas and all that. That is a different process. So, in a traditional knowledge, this is the method that we use. Here we should not use that word. So, no air does not mean this methodology. That is what I wanted to qualify second. No air is not that process. Now, for which, you know, Shankaracharya in his commentary gives an example of Devadatta with nine more. This Devadatta is a very interesting character in Vedanta. It comes everywhere. So, there is a Devadatta and then nine of them. And then he keeps on counting there are only nine. The tenth is not to be found. They are supposed to cross a ocean, I mean a river or something. They are che he is checking there are only nine. No, this is something like that. You know, I have these specs. I am keeping the specs. It happens to us. We keep searching the specs. Suddenly somebody says, right? It's called, you know, in Sanskrit it's called Swakanta Barana Nyaya. You have a chain in your own uh, kanta, in your neck. But you are searching for it. Swakanta Barana Nyaya. It happens to us. So this Vedantic knowing belongs to that category. So let me first qualify what is this knowing business, which is different from our normal understanding of the word knowing. So what do you mean by knower or knowing or all these put together? In our scheme of things, Knower is not different from known. In Brahma Vidya or Atma Vidya, there is nothing like knower different from known. Right? And these are Chinmayananda's example. I really like this. He says, by mere knowledge of table, we do not become a table. Fair enough. Knowledge of table does not make a table out of us. We are not a table anymore. Okay? By knowing somebody's bank balance, we do not become rich. He says, if that has been the case, cashiers must be the richest people, especially in a Swiss bank. <laughs> I think. <laughs> so, by knowing something, you don't become any of these. Right? So, point he is saying, the knowing that we are talking is different. That's why these examples are coming. It is a process of discovering something which you already possess. This specs was here. I have been searching all around. Somebody said, oh, it is here. Then you also realize it is here. So, this Atma Vidya, the Brahman, is part of us. This is the central theme in Vedanta. It is part of us. We have temporarily forgotten. There is It is like, you know, I have forgotten that I lifted these specs until somebody pointed to me. A guru has to point sometimes. The Swak Kantabharana Nyaya is saying somebody must point to the necklace or the chain 
around your neck. It may be a guru. It may be, you know, some divine grace that really connects all these. So, it is, first of all, therefore, this Vedantic knowledge that Aham Brahmasmi, all that they are talking about, Brahma with Apnoti Param, that knowing is actually knowing uh, something which is with us. So, the knower, known, knowing all happens simultaneously when that happens. That is the point. There is no process. See, if you have to get a PhD, you have to work for it, you have to write a thesis, submit and then one day you get a PhD. Here it is not like that. All of them happen simultaneously. The knower, known and the uh, uh, process of knowing all merge and then evaporate. That is the real knowing in this sense. Everything happens simultaneously, there are no sequential. It's not you, you, you recognize Brahman and then know it and we are trying all that. These are all processes which are all happening but when it happens it simply evaporates. All the three happen simultaneously. That is the argument in Vedantic uh, literature. So it already exists. We seem to have lost it temporarily maybe for a long time out of ignorance. That's why in, in Bhagavad Gita also he says, you know in chapter 3, he gives three examples. He says, Yatha Ulbanam. Just like the fetus is covered in the womb, you don't see it until it comes out. That's one example Krishna gives in the third chapter, Shloka 39 or 38. Another example he gives is, this uh, mirror is all smoky and dusty. You wipe it, you will see. So these are the examples given. It is already there. It is an avarna. Something, it is a bandage, it's a thick bandage cloth. So all these process is only peeling. Once you peel, knowing, known, knower, everything is the same. It happens simultaneously. That is the knowing process which is being talked. So the knower and known when we talk in Vedantic and Brahma Vidya and Atma Vidya, we have to understand this. So it's a case of searching the reading glass which is already with me. So in other words, what are we saying? It's all about realizing or experiencing. Knowing is not committing to the memory. Knowing is not putting it onto the brain or into the chitta or using the indriyas and recognition. It's experiencing or realizing. That is the idea. So, Brahma with Apnoti Param, that knower is one who has realized Brahman. That is the meaning of that short and then which is anyway expanded in the rest of the Upanishad, the Brahmananda Valli, in great detail. So it is realizing or experiencing that we already possess. It is with us. But either we haven't noticed it, or we didn't turn our attention, or we turned our attention, it hid itself somewhere. There are so many things which can happen. When you, all of them are removed, then the process becomes simultaneous. That, ah, this is what it is. You pointed to the glass and then I said, oh, this is what it is. That process, it's all simultaneous. So that is what, this is a very famous shloka in Katopanishad. Very famous shloka. He says, Paranchikani vyatrinat swayambuhu tasmat parang pashyati na antaratman. He says, it's a very nice observation. He says, the Swayambhu, this creator, did a, a design flaw. What he did was, all these frills he focused outside. Ear, eye, everything is turned this side. It's only looking outside. You know, I, you know, I think one, our guru, I once remember him saying, he said, that is, a, how, how do you like this idea? There is a beautiful house, massive, some 5,000 square feet, 7,000 square feet house, five bedroom well appointed five, five bedroom house and then what you do is you come and stand out and then look outside all the time. So the Pancha Indriyas are all there but you are all focusing it outside and just standing outside. That was the kind of an example I remember long back once he was making the reference. That's what this is saying. It's saying parang, Paranchikani Vyatrinat Swayambuhu Tasmat Parang Pashyati Na Antaratman it is not looking inside because the whole, there is a defect in the design. All the frills are turned outside. <laughs> there is no way I know how to turn my eye inside. That is the practice of Upasana and all that which we saw in Sikshavalli. 
So what is happening in these upasanas? This, this gadget turns inside. It's a remote control with which you turn, not a physical turning. <laughs> right? Then he says, Kaschiddiraha Pratyagatmanam Avaikshat So there is one dhira, one person who is this, person who has, uses his buddhi so well. That's why he is a dhira. He says, dhi is using very well, buddhi. Which means he knows Atman and Anatman, he knows Nitya and Anitya, all he knows very well. So he became a little wiser. So he said, what did he say? He said, Pratyagatmanam Avaikshat. He has a desire to see that Pratyagatma. Each one of us have a Pratyagatma. He wanted to see it. Avritta Chakshuhu. The, the Chakshu turned inside. Avritta Chakshuhu Amritatva Michan. Because he, he desired immortality. That is why he, So that realizing happens only when all these gadgets are turning inside. Now that's a very long drawn process. But certainly that is, seems to be the method. That by design they are all focused outside. So these upasanas, these uh, you know, shravana, manana, nididhyasa are methods by which this is turning inside. That's what this mantra is saying. So this is the method to actually realize within. Is what uh, Katopanishad Yama, Yama is t- telling to you know, Nachiketas. Is this shloka in Mundaka Upanishad which talks about what happens to this knower of the Brahman. Third, the, the last kanda is about that in Mundaka Upanishad. It says, Sayohavai tat paramam brimhaveda brimhaveda brimhaiva bhavati One who knows this Brahman becomes Brahman. Brimhavi, yaha brimhaveda brimhaiva bhavati Right? Paramam brimhaveda sa brimhaiva bhavati then it says, well, a few other things. What it says is, Na asya, this is in Sandhi, asya it is coming, there is a akara there. Na asya abrahmavit kule bhavati. It also says, if a, there is a knower of Brahman, in his lineage, nobody will come without the knowledge of Brahman. Abrahmavit kule na bhavati. That's what it says. Na asya, asya kule. Asya kule abrahma vit na bhavati. That's what it says. That's what it really says. You know, this uh, Prahlata, after all this Narasimha avatara, nobody could go near. It's all, you know, Narasimha is ferociously like that. So slowly in, in Srimad Bhagavatam it is there. It's a nice, beautiful canto and some of those prayers and so on. So when Prahlata goes near him, Nasimha Murti. And then he, first of all, he prays for uh, all that his father has done. That time, he says, he, and he says, you have to redeem my father for all the wrong things that he has done. The first prayer the son makes, Prahlada makes is redeem my father. For which uh, uh, the Nasimha Murti says, Sakshad Nasimha says, the moment you are born, 21 generations are taken care. <laughs> That is the kind of a reply. Moment you are born, 21 generations are taken care. So like that, na asya abrahma vid kule bhavati. That is the power of one great soul. It, it can lift. It is a fulcrum with a huge mechanical advantage. It can lift just like that any, anything on earth. That is the power of a, you know, of a, somebody like that. Then it says, Tarati Shokam. What happens to that Vyakti? Tarati Shokam. It crosses all this world of uh, Shoka. Tarati Papmanam, the world of sins. Then, Guha Grandibhyaha, Vimuktaha, Amrtaha Bhavati. The Chit Granti, that is this knot. The, when the knot is open, then all this bandage cloth goes. <laughs> In that Chetak Kuhare, in that uh, Hridaya Kuhara, it manifests. For that, the unknots happens. Everything gets unknotted. So that's what it says. So it says, Gruha Grandibhya, Vimukta, Amrta, Bhavati. So that is what Mundaka Upanishad, you know, takes. All these Upanishads are all connected because they are addressing the same issue anyway. So that's what uh, uh, really happens in terms of. Uh, 
So, if you take this sutra, Brahmavit Apnoti Param, quite seriously, then that leads us to three questions, which uh, we may have, we may show interest. First question is, what is this Brahman? Because if I have to know and I, I become everything, the first question is, what is this? I want to know it now. So, what is this Brahman? That is the one question which will come. What is this Brahman? What is this knowing process all about? What is this knowing process? You said Brahma with. What is this knowing process? Correct? And what is the sign of a successful knowing process that I have gone through? How do I know that uh, this has been accomplished? These are very analytical questions. Actually, Ram Ramakrishna Paramahamsa says, the bee will keep making noise will make a lot of noise only up to the point of it sitting in the flower. After that, no noise. It starts sucking the honey. So, all these are for people like us because we are all on the periphery. So, we will be very analytically asking these questions. It's good. I think we need to ask these questions. Much later, you know, we will silence in our own ways. But the journey for the silence is a little bit of asking questions to outside, asking questions to ourselves and then slowly those questions disappear. So, these kinds of questions are there. So, that is what the Anuvaka one continues now. So, it simply said Brahma with Apnoti Param. Now, it gives answers to these three questions in the next three sentences. We will see that. So, it says Tad Esha Abhyukta Tat Esha Abhyukta Basically, it says it, I will quote from somewhere. It is not uh, saying, uh, it says, let me quote from Rig Veda. So, and that's why it ends with iti. Vipaschitaha iti. Thus. So, it is between quote and unquote. So, this is between quote and unquote. So, it says, let me borrow from Rig Veda and tell you what it is. Because I said it in a very cryptic form. Brahma with apnoti param. So, let me slightly expand it. The rest of Brahmananda is anyway expanding it even more. But since it is a sutra, little more explanation in Anuvaka 1. That is why Anuvaka 1 is called Upanishad Sara Sangraha. The entire Upanishad Sara is collected here. That is why it is Upanishad Sara Sangraha, the first Anuvaka. So what it says, Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma. So it defines Brahman with three attributes called Satyam, Jnanam, and anantam. Satyam, jnanam, anantam, brahma. So that is the definition of Brahman. Then the next sentence talk about the knowing process. Yo veda nihitam guhayam parame vyoman. This is the way you have to know. That's what it says. You know it in your guha, in your cave of your heart. That's what it says. This reference is there in Narayana Sutta. Many places it is there. You will find, you will find. Antar bahichada sarvam vyapyanara yanastitaha. After that it continues. Just of nabhyamu paritishtati. All that it is there. It refers to that point also. It is an inverted lotus. All those are there. Adomukam. All those are Narayana Suktam. You know, all of them have this reference anyway. Right? Then the last sentence says, Saha ashnute sarvan kaman saha. Brahmana vipaschitaha. So, a person who succeeded in this realization will get this. So, those are the three sentences. They are very heavily loaded. So, that Satyam Jnana Manantam alone, about 30 or 40 pages of commentary is there in Shankara Bhashya. Because it's been a very important thing. We will see it in very whatever little way. So, we will start with Anantam first and then come to Satyam and Brahm, you know, Jnana. Becomes a little easier. So, we will start with Ananta. Now what happens is, in fact limits primarily happen on three major aspects. Limitations are generally on account of space, spatial limitation, okay, temporal limitation and a limitation on attributes. So let us see what it is. To take us, if you are here, you are not elsewhere. There is a spatial limitation for us, in some sense if you see. Right? Bangalore is not Chennai, Chennai is not Bangalore. 
San Francisco is not Singapore, Singapore is not San Francisco anyway. So there is, uh, there is a limitation of space for anything. This is what is indicated by limitation. And the implication is that uh, uh, limitation not by that, you know, this camera occupies a finite space. This room occupies a finite space. Correct? If you demolish all the walls here, it becomes Mahakasha. Now it is, it is Gadakasha. It's like a space in a pot. Gatakasha is space in a pot. You break the pot, it becomes Mahakasha. It becomes, you know, yeah, Samashti. From Vyashti, it becomes Samashti. So, the Vyashti has limitations. So, by Anantam, it's, it talks about Samashti. That is the first attribute for, uh, first characteristic of Brahman. So, a Brahman is one which is not constrained by space. The only way that can happen is it is available everywhere. That's the only way you can explain. Because we have a limitation. If you are here, you are not in your house. Or if you are in your house, you are not in your office. We have our limitation. By saying anantam and mapping it onto a spatial dimension, the first attribute we are talking about is Brahman is Sarvavyapi. So now we have to discover what is the Sarvavyapi element that will come. All the three together will actually add up everything logically. So the first thing that is being indicated is Brahman is Sarvavyapi. It is dematter. Because you know, the moment you demat it, the cash is now everywhere. All that I have to get into my website and then transfer it in my core banking account. Dematerialized. We dematted it. It's not in a moment you put it in a material medium, it is constrained. Sort of. Correct? So that's why it is Sarvavyapi. So if it is Sarvavyapi, then it has to be the reference, for, it has to be a substratum for everything. If, if something pervades the whole world, then that is a substratum. What else is the substratum? That which on which everything is, is riding now. You are riding, I am riding, this uh, lectern is there, some bus is going, bullet train is going between Tokyo and somewhere, everything is riding on something. So, and that something is everywhere. So, it becomes a kutasta. It becomes an anvil. It becomes the substratum. So, that's the first definition of limitation. Second de definition of limitation is time. Right? This time limitation is even more powerful. Ten years, I mean, it, it pervades into anything. I exist now, I don't exist 100 years from now. I did not exist 100 years before. I as an Vyaktikal Mahadevan did not exist 100 years before. I am not going to exist. Maybe another 30, 40, 50, but nobody knows. Beyond that. If the Vastu, everything that we see here are actually bound by a certain kind of a time. There is a notion of time. It is not just people. Ten years back I was told that palm oil is good. Today they say palm oil is not good. Even those concepts have time. They also have limitation. They also go through the limitation of time. Every three years research turns upside down. They use the word shelf life. So it is not people. Looks like there are a whole lot of things which are constrained by time. Whereas the, when you say anantam, it talks about Something which is kalatita, which is not subjected to the rules of. See, there is this German saying: nobody can, nobody can cross the same river twice in their life. What it means is, at 6:33, 20 seconds, if you crossed, if you come back, the 6:33, 40 seconds, the river is different in its composition, right? Time and tide waits for no man. We are all constrained with that kind of a notion of time. Whether it is, here the definition is that since Brahman is anantam, the temporal constraint is gone. Which means it must be ever present. It must be present in the past. It must be present in the present. It must be present in the future also. So it is Shashwatam or Nityam. That is the second attribute of Anantam. In fact, uh, I was hearing on uh, Pravachan, <laughs> very nice reference. He quoted Swami Chinmayananda. Swami Chinmayananda says, so and so, 1915-1982. 1915-1982. 
right? Sinmayananda says, you know what means? He is dashing from womb to the tomb. <laughs> I really like that, you know, Sinmayananda was making the reference, apparently somebody quoted it. So, 1915 to 1983 means, 1915 he came out of the womb, and in 1983 he dashed into, he was dashing from here to the, we are all dashing from one womb to the tomb. We have a constraint of time. That's what it talks about. Brahman does not, is not subjected to the loss of time. So, eternal or Shashvatam or Nityam Puranaha Navacha. Puracha Navacha Puranaha. It's also old, it's also new. It will also remain. That's the word. The Purana has come from there. Puracha Navacha. It is relevant those days and relevant today also. That's why it's called Puranaha. Puranam, sorry. Third, is attributes. See, everything, the world that we know is made of Nama, Rupa and Guna. This is all we know. You know, there is something called table, there is something called chair, chair is different from table, table is different from, you know, an easy chair, that's different from a computer table, that's different from a wooden table, is different from a steel table. Our understanding of anything is constrained by Nama, Rupa and Guna. These are the three constraints. Now, uh, Brahman's definition of Anantam, Anantam is it pervades that also. It, it is beyond all that. So what does that mean? That means you cannot use these visible attributes to define a Brahman. That is what it is coming to. Otherwise you can't uh, you know, reconcile this definition. So it is Nirupadi. See, if you demolish this, all, everything, I can't name this anything. It is called Akasha, that's all. It's Mahakasha. Maha Akash. Moment you put a constraint to it, it becomes, it gets a Nama and Rupa. A, a small, an enclosure is called a bedroom. An enclosure is called a kitchen. An enclosure is called a classroom. How? You constrained it. If you unconstrained it, it will lose Nama, Rupa and Guna. That is the point I am coming to. In other words, whenever you talk of constraints in terms of attributes, what we are saying is there is a Nama, Rupa and Guna which characterizes something. Here is a definition of Ananta which is beyond that, which means you have to take Nama, Rupa and Guna out of the equation. That is called... So that is the next, uh, uh, you know, uh, difference. That's why in Lalita Sasrama I put, I put those names. Desha Kala Aparichinnaya Inamaha. She is not a Desha Kala Parichinna. Parichinna is constrained. It is Aparichinna. Desha Kala Aparichinnaya Inamaha. That is one. Then you look at little later, a few, ten slokas later they will come. This was the end of Lalita Sasrama. You will find Loka Tita, Guna Tita, Sarva Tita. She transcends all these limitations of space, loka is space, guna is all these attributes that we talk about. You will find in all the sasramas, you will find this. It is aparichinna bhava. It is not parichinna bhava, it is aparichinna bhava. So that is the definition. So in other words, when we see a world of multiplicity, correct? Then in the world of, because we said it is ananta, then there must be Brahman everywhere. So, in the world of multiplicity, Brahman appears to be mutually exclusive. I look different from you. This camera looks different from something else. Table looks from different from chair and so on. So, while in the world of multiplicity, Brahman appears to be mutually exclusive, the definition here is it is collectively exhaustive. In probability, they use the word mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. That is the definition. Brahman is collectively exhaustive, which means the entire sample space has nothing but Brahman. That is the Anantam part which is coming. So let's now go to Satyam. We will now go to the first. Satyam is one which has Sat. Sat Bhavaha Yatra Asti, that's Satyam. There are many ways to understand. One is this. Right? Satyam is that which is the very existence. Now, what do you mean by this very existence? Now, if I make a few statements, the chair is made of wood, the table is made of steel, 
right? The mountain is huge. Raju is my good friend. Okay? Lakshmi is known to me. In all these, there is a is. You have all these world of multiplicity, but there is also a is you use. That is the sat. That is that you attach to anything. There is an event. That event also needs a is now. There is a is which we use. That isness is satya. Sat. That isness is actually called sat actually. Right? You know, in all the South Dravidian languages, I think. I don't know about North Indian languages. When somebody is dead, they in, a, in Tamil they say Sethu Paitar. Kannada, Sethu Idare. Sattu Hogide. It is not Sethu. The Sat has gone. The Is has become Was. That is the meaning actually. Over time, must, it must have become like that. Our Sethu Idare, Sethu Paitar, like that they say, I don't know Telugu, I don't know what they say. Maybe something equivalent to that, it will be Dravidian languages will be very similar. I don't know that. Huh? So that sat is gone. That is being communicated with this word. The is. What is supplying is? Who is supplying the is? That is is the expression of Brahman in the table. That is is the expression of the Brahman, Brahman in the LCD projector or a person or this or that. That is the sat. That is one way. To understand. So everywhere when you have to point to something, you you are actually referring to some there is something you refer to and when you point to and saying something, in English we use the word is that is is actually sat in in a way. Another way is another definition of satya is that which does not change. That which not change from yesterday to today to tomorrow. It's also called real. Another word is real versus unreal. In fact, uh, there is a nice shloka in chapter 2. Nasate vidyato bhavaha. Nabhava vidyate sataha. There is a nice shloka. You will not find unreal in real. You will not find real in unreal. They are not possible. You cannot see anatman in atman or atman in anatman. You cannot see anartha in artha and artha and anartha. They are like day and night. They are absolutely like paraspara viruddha bhavaha. Tamaprakashavat paraspara viruddha bhavaha. It's like the conflict between night and day. Night and day cannot coexist. It's impossible. When night exists, day will not exist. When day exists, night cannot exist. That's why tamaha and prakasha are viruddha bhava. Like that, sat and asat are. So, sat is that which will not change. So all that they are changing is the asat of a sat that you are seeing. This has to be thought about. I will give you some example. Think of a newborn baby. Same person is 2 years old. Same person is 20 years old. Same person is 70 years old. Same person is 90 years old. That 90 year old person will have the audacity to take a 1 year old photo and say I am so, this is me. <laughs> there is nothing me in that. But looks like there is some me there. Because science says every seven years, the six billion cells are shunted out. So from a simple science, you are not the same person every six years. Because lock, stock and barrel, you have cleaned your cells. Every six billion cells are thrown away in a in span of seven years. And what we have, so this Mahadevan consisting of six billion cells was not one which was seven years back. Still, I have the audacity to say I am so and so. The, the, the Tata shows the photo and says I am one year old. How, where is the connection? What is that? Why are we reconciled with that and we are not agitated about that idea? Because we see the Sat there. While I am changing, I am not changing also. While I change, I don't change. That is why I had the audacity to say I am the same person. Photo looks a little different, but you find, oh, yeah, 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 I think there is something, I see you. And I reconcile to that idea. So, that which does not change, that which cannot change, that is the meaning of the satyam also, which we use in common parlance. You, if you say something and it changes, it is not satya, it is asatya. So, that which is satya is an expression of Brahman. That is that expression of godliness, which actually comes. 
So that is the second. Look at this uh, Chandogya Upanishad. So again, a very famous quote. It's a very powerful quote actually. It says, Yata Saumya Yekena Mridpundena Sarvam Rinmayam Vignatam Tasya, right? Vignatasyat. It says, Vacharambanam Vikaro Namadeyam Mrittiketyeva Satyam. It's a very powerful argument. He says, moment you see one part moment you see one part you must be able to demolish all items made of clay and say this is actually clay this word vacharambanam vikaraha the vikaraha comes only when you start using words for vyavahara you may do it you may call the same clay you may call it as teacup same clay you may call it as flower vase same clay you may call it as water pot this is all vacharambanam. You are, you are, you are started talking. And why did you start talking? Because you wanted to do vyavahara for which you wanted to create your own vocabulary. You wanted, that's what that uh, Rishi is saying. He says, hey Saumya, by seeing one clay part, you will find mrittike, mrittikatyeva satyam. The unchanging part in all of them is only the clay. You will see the clay. You, you can choose to see only clay in everything. Moment you see me one cotton dress, you bring any number of cotton dress, I will see only cotton there. It's possible that we, we, we these are all only because for Vyavara we wanted to say shirt and pant and all that. At the end of the day, all of them are cotton. Period. That is what he is saying. So that is the Satya. Satyam is the bedrock. On that also, there is this notion of Karya and Karana. This, this Chandogya Upanishad mantra actually brings us the notion of Karya and Karana. The clay is the Karana. The flower vase is a Karya. It is a specific manifestation of a generic cause. Karya is effect. Karana is cause. There is a cause and there is an effect. The effect is what you see. Satyam is not the effect. The effect has all changing. Because then if, you, if I don't say this, you will come and say, no sir, you say these objects are all, uh, just now you said anantam, the objects are not anantam, you are going to go. One day, this body is going to fall. Which means, in this body there is a changing and a non-changing component, we have to now check that. That is why Karya Karana thing is required. There is, uh, so you can destroy the uh, part, but you can still recover the clay. Nobody can say I melted the ornament but I did not get the gold. You will get the gold. Gold can go nowhere. Ornament will go. The necklace will go, the bangle will glow. Gold cannot go. You know, gold is the sat. Gold is the satyam. Gold is the satyam in, in that. That's what he says. These are all vacharambana. For the purpose of our Vyavahara, we create terminologies and create seemingly differences. Right? We simply call this actually as a classroom. Demolish everything, it becomes a space. It's a vacharambana. We wanted to use a word classroom so that you understand what it means. You know what you are supposed to do here. If I say it is a kitchen, you know what to do. If it is a temple, you know what to do. So, these are all, this temple, kitchen, classroom are all karya. The karana is the mahakasha, the space. Space is the karana. These are the karya. So, Sat or Satyam is Karana. All the manifestations you see are Karana. That's why I, you know, there is this equation. I always write this equation. So, the equation is Guna plus Nama plus Rupa. When you take the world of multiplicity, it has Guna plus Nama plus Rupa. It also has something else. This Nama plus Guna plus Rupa is called Prakriti. In Bhagavad Gita, I, I used to refer these equations. That right side in the flower bracket is called Prakriti. The left side is going to be Purusha. Chapter 13, they talk about Kshetra. That is a Kshetra, this is a Kshetra Jna. Actually, that's what all those are. So we are introduced the term now. Now we are saying, every world of object that you see will have a Sat. Of course, it has a Nama, Rupa and Guna. This place has a Nama, Rupa and Guna. But it has a Sat called space. But it has a Nama, Rupa and it is called C13 in IA in Bangalore terms. It's called a classroom. It has a certain property of, uh, you know, tra used for uh, transacting knowledge with uh, teacher and a student. So that is the Nama, Rupa and Guna. But there is a Sat. 
That is, this is nothing but space. A certain manifestation of the space. That is called Sat. So that is why it is Ananta. Now it is Ananta also. This is now it has empirically generalized all your world of objects. Can all be empir empirically generalized. So that is the definition of Satyam. Then it talks about Jnana. Okay? Now again, Jnana is not this worldly knowledge. Very clearly because worldly knowledge is limited in terms of context, in terms of location. So, so if they say one of the attributes of Jnana is Brahman, it is not management knowledge, it is not knowledge of anesthesia or poly polymer physics or electrical engineering, nothing. Because they, are all, they will then violate the first principle called Ananta. Now Ananta is gone now if you accept this definition. So it is not that definition. Here Jnana has to honor the Ananta principle. So now we need to look at this whole idea of knowledge. Now you take any knowledge. You take any knowledge. I have a knowledge that uh, you know this, uh, there is a way to go from here to a place which I am looking at. I have a knowledge of how to cook. I have a knowledge of doing something. So we talk about knowledge. Now if you look at all these examples, there is something common between all these. I know how to cook, I know how to teach, I know how to lecture, I know how to understand what you say. All these are so-called knowledge that I have, let us say. Now you have to ask, in fact all these knowledge at the, at the outset are all belonging to this limitation. I know how to cook is a limited knowledge because if you know how to cook uh, upma, I will ask you to cook, make jilebi, finished, my job is over, my knowledge is gone. Or if we say, you know, I know how to go to, you know, Coimbatore, uh, last me to go to Istanbul by road from here, finished. My knowledge is gone. So they are all limited. But, so what is that we are talking about knowledge then? Now if you look at the process of knowledge, the process of gathering knowledge requires a very, very important component called consciousness. Without consciousness, knowledge is not gathered. It is not possible. Tell me, how is it possible to gather knowledge without consciousness? The classic example is, Swami Vivekananda, I remember I have read somewhere, he says there is a train running at a high speed on a railway track. Okay? And he says, in the two rails, there is one small worm in one rail, small little worm, and there is a piece of stone in the other rail. He says, it is very simple. This worm will try to get out. The stone cannot get out. There is a drain coming. The worm may succeed, not succeed. That is a different issue. The prayatna will be there. There is a prayerna and there is a prayatna. We may not know it. It may sense, it has its own antenna system. It senses something unusual. It may be in the form of vibration. I don't know what it is. That worm will try to get out. Correct? This stone cannot get out. Why? Because that has chit. Stone doesn't have chit. So, so the knowledge, to acquire knowledge you need chit first. Then you need your buddhi, your jnana indriyas are all later. The enabling mechanism is chit. If you don't uh, get a convince of this example, let me give you another example. There is one great philosopher, great pravachaka. He uses a particular uh, audio visual system PA system, he has told thousands of hours of lecturing, nothing will happen to the mic. Mic is a, you know, <laughs> mic is a companion for that great person. Mic should have become much more revolved in life, na? <laughs> Why? Because mic does not have chit. It is a jada. <coughs> so it cannot acquire knowledge. So by this word knowledge, it didn't mean this front end. It again talks the sukshma. The sukshma is that chit. Without chit, knowledge is impossible. So that is the second component of Brahman. So if you again go back to the world of multiplicity, I have to add one more into the equation now. The world of multiplicity has a prakriti, which is nama, rupa and kuna. But on this side, it has not only sat, it also has chit. Only then knowledge will take place. And that jnanam 
is obviously anantam. This consciousness pervades. My consciousness is no different from your consciousness. There is an intrinsic concept called consciousness. It is like saying the electricity which glows this light is no different from the electricity which actually runs a heater is no different from another electricity which runs the cooler. If a refrigerator and a AC also uses the electricity. The hot plate also uses electricity although in opposite effects. But what enables them is actually electricity. Which, I, which is actually what I am talking about. So the, everyone, the whole world, the whole Jagat, the whole creation of this great Lord is characterized by Sat and Chit. In certain cases where Chit is not there, it becomes a Jada. So that knowledge cannot acquire. Knowledge cannot happen. Prakriti can go through all its Prakriti Visesha. Sat will be there. But existence may be there, knowledge may not be there. Existence of the my cannot be challenged, but knowledge of the my can be challenged now. So Sat may be there in some cases, Chit may not be there, but Chit, wherever it is there, that is what is contributing to the world of knowledge. So that is the Jnanam that is being talked about, which qualifies the Brahman. So now this makes Satyam Jnanam Anantam. This definition of Sat and this definition of Jnana, which is Chit, is ananta. It is not constrained. Consciousness is not constrained by anything. It cannot be constrained by anything. It, because if you have to constrain, please understand, if you have to constrain, you need an upadi. You need some material cause to bring limitations. The material cause are on the right side of the equation. Nama, Rupa and Guna. In the second flower bracket. Now we are talking about the first flower bracket. So in other words, every one of us have a Brahman component and a Prakriti component. This is what Bhagavad Gita chapter 13 in great detail talks about. Purusha and Prakriti, Kshetra and Kshetrajna, all those are part of that. So that is actually the Anantam part. So that is the first definition Brahmananda only makes. It says, Brahman is Satyam, which means the very existence that you can attribute. Existence is there. Existence is recognized only with Chit. Otherwise, you cannot even recognize existence. So, Sat and Chit coexist. And that right Sat and Chit may give us Ananda. That's the next part. That may be a different thing. Right? In, 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 in uh, you know, Mandukya Upanishad, the definition is, it says Sundaram, Satyam, all that, it comes in a different way. Brahman is uh, def you know, defined differently in Mandukya Upanishad. That's okay. So, here it says it is all about Satyam, Jnanam and Anantam. This is the very definition of Brahman. The greatest implication of accepting this definition is Brahman is everywhere. Because of these three properties, Brahman has to be everywhere. In the world of multiplicity, you must be able to see Brahman. That is what in Bhagavad Gita chapter 7 in the seventh shloka, Krishna says, Matta parataram na anyat kinchidasti dananjaya, mai sarvamitam protam sutre manigana eva. He says, There is not even a speck of dust other than me that you can ever see. Mattaha parataram na anyat kinchidasti, not even a speck of dust you will see, which is not me. That definition reminds us Satyam jnanam anantam brahma. That is what is the entire triplet of, second triplet of Bhagavad Gita rests on that one shloka. See, my reading of Bhagavad Gita is as follows. Bhagavad Gita has three triplets. First six chapters, second six chapters and third six chapters. In each triplet, there is only one shloka. The entire shloka is in the triplet actually answers only that shloka. If you ask me what is the shloka for the first triplet, that shloka is karmanyeva adhikaraha maapaleshu kadachana Ma karma pala hetur bohu mate sangastu akarmani. That one shloka is completely explained in chapter 3, 4, 5, 6. Karma yoga, karma sannyasa yoga, jnana karma, everything talks about how do you do tasmat karma kaunte mukta sangha samachara. How do you manage work? Entire first six chapters is on that. The entire six chapters starting from 7 to 12 is an explanation of this shloka. 
matta parataram na anyat kinchi dasti dhananje. Up to Virat Rupa he is showing that only idea only. It is nothing other than me. Entire second triplet of Bhagavad Gita is only resting on this one single shloka. Which says matta parataram na anyat. I call it as law of conservation of divinity. That is the second triplet of Bhagavad Gita. Divinity can neither be created nor be destroyed. Divinity will constantly transform from one form to another form. This is the law of conservation of divinity. The third triplet of entire Bhagavad Gita is rested on 22nd shloka in chapter 13. Karanam guna sangaha asya sad asad janmani onishu. There is one shloka which says the Purusha used a gum called guna. With that it got stuck with Prakriti. Because it got stuck with Prakriti, Sat Asat Yonisu Janmasu. This birth, rebirth into good Yoni and bad Yoni all happens because of this gum called Guna. Entire third triplet is how do you dry the gum called Guna. That is why you have Gunatreya Vibhaga Yoga, Devasri Sampad, you have Shraddhatreya Vibhaga Yoga. Everything talks about only Guna. If you can't dry, that's why Gunati Tahasa Uchate. That's what the culmination of chapter 14. Sarvaramba Parityagi Gunati Tahasa Uchate. Krishna says, go beyond Gunati Bhava. If you get that is all reminded of this single sentence Satyam Yanamanantam Brahma. That conveys all these teachings in, in Bhagavad Gita, in all the Upanishads, is coming here. So we will see, we will continue it in the next class. It is already 7 o'clock. We will stop here.